When I pray, I feel my heart go deeper, my heart go deeper into my God. When I pray, I feel my heart go deeper, my heart go deeper into my God. Right here, right now, right where I Pray right here, right now, right where I am. I pray when I pray, I feel my soul go deeper, my soul go deeper into my God. When I pray, I feel my soul go deeper. My soul go deeper into my God Right here, right now Right where I am, I pray Right here, right now Right where I am, I pray When I pray I feel my love go deeper, my love go deeper into my God. When I pray, I feel my love go deeper, my love go deeper into my God. Right here, right now, right where you back we're glad you got moved and took care of all that business and now here you are again and we are Thank delighted you. to have you glad Great to be back to have you so now we can do unity's statement of faith there is only one power and one presence in the universe and in, in my life God the good mm -hmm. omnipotent Surely the presence of God is in this place. I can feel the mighty power and the grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of God is in this place. Surely the presence of God is in this place. I can feel the mighty power and the grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of God is in this place. So I'd like you just to take a deep breath and relax in your chair. You can rest your eyes if that feels comfortable. Open and receptive to the sweet presence of divine spirit within. We hear the gentle whisper of divine inspiration. Our hearts speak of the love, the deep love that we hold for our beloved creator. Divine Spirit is our all. 
the life within, the air we breathe, and the holy ground that we walk on. Everything, everything is sacred. In the very depths of our soul, God knows our deep yearning to experience divine love and express it as compassion and joy. Our deep love for God inspires us to acts of kindness, words of encouragement, and consideration of others. We feel the warmth of God's love in the kind gestures and the voices of the people that care about us. It is their words of encouragement. It's the actions, the thoughtful actions that they present to us and we know that they are expressing divine love. And for each and every one of them, we say thank you, God. Our souls are lifted and we are grateful for the blessings of God, for our life, for love, for peace, for joy. And so it is. Amen. Mm, beautiful. Mm. This next song is one of my own. Felt it was a fit for the topic today. I'm in my spiral of becoming the me I know I am, remembering each day I am worthy of and grateful for all that I have each and every step along my way and I look for the gifts in every situation no matter how painful they may seem and for the joyful time Graciously embrace them with love and allow myself to be this light deep within me is the divine it shines through everything I am. I'll be wise and grateful, growing each day into more of the divine. And you know I look for the gifts in every situation, no matter how painful they may seem. And for the joyful times, I graciously embrace them, love and allow myself to be, because each day is a gift. That's why it's called the present And it's exactly where I'm meant to be In my spiral of becoming The me I know I am Remembering more of my own truths each day I am worthy of and grateful for All that I have Each and every step along situation no matter how painful they may seem and for the joyful times I graciously embrace them with love and allow myself to be I'm in my spiral of becoming I'm in my spiral 
I'm in my spiral of becoming. I think that's where we all are, Malin. We're all <laughs> in our spiral of becoming. And last week we, um, we talked about the fact that everything we do is a preparation for our own ability to release and die. And then this week we talk about intimacy. Almost just saying that word feels a little different, doesn't it? You know, we talk about love all the time, but talking about intimacy as the step towards love is a little different than we usually talk about it. So I went to Charles Fillmore and Revealing Word, and this is what Charles says about love. It's the pure essence of being that binds together the whole human family. All of the attributes of God's love is undoubtedly the more beautiful. In divine mind, love is the power that joins together joins and binds in divine harmony the universe and everything in it. The great harmonizing principle known to humanity. I don't know what world you live in, but the world I live in, I am using my best sight to see the love that's binding us all together. I want to believe in that principle. I want to have it happen. But as I am aware of the different things that are happening in all of your lives and in your family's lives, when I look at the things that are happening in my own life, it's hard sometimes to see that harmonizing principle that holds us all together. And to me, this chapter from The Immortal Diamond by Richard Rohr is helping me kind of see what's missing, if that makes any sense to you. You know, what we can improve, what we can change, how we can make it different than it is. And as with almost everything that we study in unity. The principle is really simple, but that doesn't make it easy to live with. You know, when we talk about love and the fact that we should love, that's what souls do. But we all walk around in her human earth suits. And when we walk around in this her human earth suit, it's easy to notice different things. So souls know that it's all about love. Egos don't. So if we can touch into our own souls and into the souls of others, so that it's souls communicating, we could be amazed. I truly believe we could be amazed by the souls of all the people around us. The souls of animals. Those of us with pets love those pets. And yet we also have love for all the animals. Are we touching their souls? The souls of the trees, the forests, the clouds, the galaxies. Ram Dass said we should all love. That's what souls do. Egos don't, but souls do. Become a soul, look around you, and you'll be amazed all the beings around you are souls and we don't leave out animals, trees, clouds, and galaxies. It's all one energy. That's different 
than how we live. Some of you will recognize a line that is one of my favorite lines. We are all stardust. We are golden. We've got to get ourselves back to the garden. You all know who I'm quoting, Joni Mitchell. We all know that song, we all see the stardust that we all are. And I've discovered over the years that the wonderful thing about unity is unity has water that's shallow enough for babies to crawl in. Our truth principles can be absolutely simple. But beyond that simplicity, there's water deep enough for ocean liners. And that's where we're going today with our discussion about intimacy. Shallow enough for babies, deep enough for ocean liners. That was a phrase that one of my mentors, Mary Omwick, who used to have the church in Overland Park, Kansas, used to say over and over. And it didn't make so much sense to me as a new minister, but the longer that I'm in unity, the more sense it makes to me. You know, when we talk about intimacy, it's an interesting topic. Some of you are introverts, and the idea of being intimate is scary. Some of you are extroverts, and I don't know that that makes intimacy any less scary. Most of us are, and sometimes, a mix of both. But also, a lot of us describe ourselves as private people. We don't want to talk about our inner thoughts, our inner behavior, the way that we move in this world. What do you allow yourself to easily be intimate with? Now, I'd love to ask that question and have you answer it, but I'm not going to ask you to do that because I realize that that's an intimate question. But try it on yourself. What do you see yourself being intimate with? I know some people have absolutely no difficulty being at intimate with animals. They love them, they express their love, they talk about how they love their animals. Some people can be intimate with children. Some people can be intimate with everyone they meet. You've all been around me long enough to know that I tell you some pretty private things. I hope I'm only telling you from the point of view of allowing you to be fully you. You know, it's not my biggest bragging point that I was fired. It's not, not that I want everyone to know that, you know, I was pregnant when I got married as a teenager. But I only tell people those kinds of things to allow you to know that whoever you are, you are absolutely perfect just the way you are. To let you know that there's not some artificial standard, that we are trying to maintain an image. When we talk about the Enneagram, we're talking about the false self that we project into the world. And that's a very useful face. We need to know how to be professional in professional circumstances. But we also need to know how to let that mask down and how to be ourselves when we choose to do it. 
That's essentially what we're thinking about today. How does intimacy, the ability to love and be loved, however you are, play in to the way our world is today? What keeps us from that level of communication, that level of sharing, that level of depth, that is different than the superficial, hi, how are you, I'm fine. We all know the difference between genuine caring, genuine commitment to care for everyone who walks in this door. You're here and we love you. We appreciate you. We're committed to your well-being and your growth. All of that is about letting the energy of others into our being. Rather than keeping each other at arm's length. In unity, we tend to hug you. If you don't want to be hugged, tell us and we'll try to not hug you. But that hugging is the symbol of the fact, as is this circle, that you're all included. No one above you, no one below you. Everyone beside you. Everyone a part of that circle. And that honestly begins with a deep capacity for being intimate with yourself. What do you not even admit to yourself? Are you open and available to life? Or are you defended and protected and behind a shell? Here's what I found. <laughs> Sorry, I touched my watch accidentally. You know, we are always larger after an intimate encounter. Richard Rohr suggests that the only way to enlarge spiritually is through an intimate encounter. So you can begin with thinking about when you've sat down and shared with somebody on a really intimate level with them. There's a feeling of oneness that happens when we do that. There's a feeling of, I'm better, I'm included. And if we want to just say the word that is the elephant in the room when we talk about intimacy, it's sex. We're all adults here. I'm guessing we've all had sex. And we all know that moment after sex when we feel like we are one with this other individual. We are melded with them. We are having the experience of intimacy. Now, we don't have to run around and have sex with each other. That's not what I'm suggesting here. But think about how that connects you. And then think about our world and how disconnected we are. How we look at our differences, we look at why someone else is different than we are, and then we use that to divide ourselves even further. It's grace when we have that experience of divine intimacy, perfect transparency, accessibility, radiant visibility. Those are all ways that our true self can be described. It's valuable for us each to be honest with each other. Isn't it wonderful to be together and not have to pretend anything. 
That was one of the gifts that I received from being in Mexico for a month. All of the people at Namaste Village are older. And my first response when I saw, remember I've told you it was very hot down there. My first response when I saw some of these um, women my age who were dressed in sundresses, I thought, they're too old to dress like that. Little bit of judgment on Doris's part there. After spending four weeks with those people, I saw that all of those judgments had faded away. What if we don't walk in here worried about what we're wearing? Most of us don't care. We're pretty casually dressed. So it doesn't matter. But think of all the myriad of details we have in our lives where we are afraid to be ourselves. I cut off my hair. These are my curls. I'm not straightening my hair. Did you think I looked more professional when my hair was long and straight? Again, that's just a trivial example, but that's a way that I was trying to project a professional image, trying to look a little bit younger because it was straight and more trendy. Those are the opposite of being transparent and intimate. When we talk about intimacy, Richard Rohr uses the example of the risen Christ. So the risen Christ comes to others and does not demand that they go to him. He tells them, I am with you always. And he opens up and shows them and invites them to touch the wound in his side. If we think of having surgery, not being stabbed with a spear, and we think of, here's my scar. Would you like to touch my scar? We don't behave that way. We have social norms. But that's not the example that Jesus gave. He said, touch me and see for yourself. He shows them his wounded hands and his feet. They are speechless. He carries the scars. Are we willing to show each other our scars? Some of our scars are visible. I can show you a scar on my knee from surgery. Some of my scars I'd rather not show you. They're in more intimate places. And it wouldn't be appropriate on a Sunday morning for me to show you those scars. But can you imagine a world where we're not ashamed of scars from surgery, scars from the life we've led, scars from our teenage years, scars from our 20s, scars of the relationships we've had that didn't work. It's a different world. Resurrection isn't woundedness desi denied, forgotten, or even totally healed. It's always woundedness transformed. You still carry your scars forever as both a message and a trophy. They still hurt in a way that keeps you mindful and humble, but they no longer allow you to hurt other people. Pain transformed isn't pain transmitted. When we look at the, I'm going to use the word evil, when we look at the way people act sometimes, and the way they injure each other, that's their pain transmitted onto other people. 
We don't always learn what a person's pain is before not well before we I'm going to say sentence them before they're sent to jail but behind tragic actions are often very deep wounds so if you think about the people that you are aware of perhaps even your own family members who have done inappropriate things we know it's from the wounds that they carry inside of them that aren't exposed and that therefore aren't healed. Love gets us to healing faster than anything else. So we are called to love the unlovable. Think about your biggest challenges, whether they are your family, friends, or neighbors. Who is it really, really hard for you to love? And what in them is hard for you to love? And what caused what's in them that's hard for you to love? That's one of the gifts of a 12-step group. They all walk in and say, hi, I'm Doris, I'm an alcoholic. They start with their wound, and then they share their stories. If we allow people to start with their wound and tell us their story, we are in a different position to love them than we were before. How do we love the unlovable? How do we love the wound? How do we love the fact that they still hurt and are in pain? Pain transformed is no longer pain transmitted. I had a conversation when I was at the memorial service the the dinner after the memorial service on Friday night and someone at the table was off on Putin and how horrible and awful he is and she wanted me to concur that he was horrible now is he responsible for some horrible acts absolutely there's no denying that. Thousands of people are dead because of his actions. What's his wound? Now, we may never know. Biographers, you know, 50 or 100 years from now may know, but we don't know in this moment what it is. How do we love someone despite their actions? That's why that quote from the beginning is what only counts. Only our soul, only the divine in us, can love unconditionally. How do we bring that to the surface? How do we allow that love to manifest in people's life? Going back to the resurrection for a moment, there's Mary Magdalene who doesn't even recognize Jesus by sight, but when he says her name, she remembers his voice. Jesus says to her, don't cling to me. That statement is what makes true intimacy possible because Intimacy can only happen between two calm people. If you're angry and you're at odds with someone, there can be no intimacy. So if we can actually say, don't cling to me, I release you. If we become calm, 
we can actually talk to each other. We have the story of Jesus and Peter, who Jesus asked three times, do you love me? Now, Peter didn't just reply, I love you too. He says, you know that I love you. How many people can say that? I know that you love me. No matter what I do, no matter what you do, know that I love you. That's the kind of intimacy that we're actually, I'm going to say, aiming for. What comes first? Feeling safe or love? If you feel safe, you can feel love. If you feel love, it's easy for you to love. We have one of those wonderful chicken and egg situations. Can you be the one to love first? If we want to feel God's love for us, and you all know where God is, pull your shirt out, look down, it's you. If you want to feel God's love, you have to love God. You have to love yourself. And then you can share that love with other people. A lot of the mystics of the spiritual world, whether we're talking about Rumi or Hafiz or Lady Julian, Julian of Norwich, all the different people, is they talk about God like he's their lover. That is not language that has ever come easily to me. You don't find me using flowery, flowery <laughs> language about God. You don't find me using flowery, why is that word hard? Flowery language about myself. And that tells you something about my personality tells you something about my blocks. It tells you something about how I was raised. So describing the language of lovers and using the language of lovers to talk about God is a bit of a stretch for me. Tenderness, specialness, Nakedness, risk, ecstasy, incessant longing. Those are all words that people use for lovers. That's words that some people describe to describe that longing for God. The mystical vocabulary of saints. I have bad news for you. Doris is not a saint. <laughs> I don't qualify for that yet. But the concept of love being bigger and deeper than we tend to speak about is really an interesting thing to me. Lori said when she read this chapter in the book, it caused her to write the meditation that she wrote about love. How do each of you speak about love? Is there a distinction? What do you reserve your love language for? When vulnerable exchange happens, there's always a broadening of being on both sides. We're bigger and better people afterwards. How vulnerable 
can you be? What degree of vulnerability, of exposure, of transparency are you comfortable with? And who can you share it with? Only when we're in a tender place can the divine in us safely reveal the God in us to us. It's a trick. <laughs> it's, it's a puzzle. How can we do that? We know that we'll be changed if and when we do it. And yet, how do we step up to moving in that tender way towards others? You can only give more when you see how the other used and enjoyed their first dose of love. Let's bring it back to a human level again. When did you feel safe to tell your partner or a partner that you loved them? That you were vulnerable with them? Were you the first one to say, I love you? Or did it take you days, weeks, months, years? Did you never do it? Love. That's what's going to change our world and love expressed again to what we think is lovable. 1 John 4, 8 says, anyone who is Anyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Anyone who fails to love can never know God because God is love. Now we know we're not talking about a separate dude in a white nightgown sitting on a throne. But how Anyone who is born of God, we were born of God's, our parents. Anyone who knows God knows who they are. Anyone who fails to love can never know God because God is love. It's an amazing but seldom quoted line and it lets you in on a big secret and it also makes it universal and available to all. Every person is divine. If we each knew that divinity, that love within us, and could express that love to the God sitting beside us, we could change the world. How do we communicate to others what is inherently a secret? Is it possible? Can the secret become unhidden? It becomes unhidden when people stop hiding from God, from themselves, and maybe even one other person? Could we expand it to two? How many people can we love? Our emergence of our divine self, of our true self, is actually the biggest disclosure that we make. The self-disclosure is what is meant by true intimacy and that kind of true intimacy is the way that love is transmitted. Intimacy happens when we reveal and expose our insides. And that's always scary. One never knows if the other person can receive what is exposed. Can you receive what is shared? Will they respect it? 
or will they betray your trust? That's honestly how most of us learn to put up a shell. Someone betrayed our trust. Someone we loved let us down. So we got into this space of, I'm not going to do that again, because it hurt too much the last time. How do we learn to love with the vulnerability of children? My three-year-old grandson, Jay, will run straight into my arms and he will tell me immediately, I love you. How long will that last? Where will the block come to Jay so that he no longer is this way with his love, but rather is this way with his love? I can only love my stuffed animal. I can only love my dog. I can only love to regain that openness is our goal. Because we know we truly cannot be hurt. What gets hurt is our ego. He said, she said. Fill in the blank with your own language from your own heart. Once we know that whoever we're with is safe and we can tell them our deepest, darkest secret and they will still love us, then they can love us and we can love them back. Somebody has to go first, guys. It's our job. Because we are truth students. We do know the truth. We can only give what we have received ourselves. And in our community, we receive the gift of unconditional acceptance and love. So we need and belong to each other, we become not our own. It's almost impossible to fall in love with majesty, power, or perfection. On some level, love can only happen between equals and vulnerability levels, levels the playing field. I can tell you right now, Doris is not perfect. But I can tell you right now that Doris will listen to whatever is on your heart to share. That's what I can offer. True human intimacy is rare and hard for all of us. Sometimes it's even hardest for men who deem themselves to be important people. Those who are trained to protect their boundaries, to take the offensive, to be afraid of all weakness or neediness. God begins thawing this glacial barrier by coming precisely in male form as Jesus. And that male figure had to die. And the reborn Jesus, the re, um, where's my word, resurrected Jesus, shows his wounds the way that the pre-crucified pre Jesus did not. Richard Rohr, of course, is a Catholic monk. And he says that intimacy is the only gateway into the temple of human or divine love. Both healthy celibacy, which he practiced, and sexual encounter demand deep and true intimacy, and both can be the most effective avoidance of it. And Richard writes this after 50 years in a celibate community of men 
and after lots of years of counseling both given and received in a strangely sexualized word world remember everyone who is born of God and who knows God, and who knows God anyone I'm sorry everyone who loves is born of God and knows God anyone who fails to love can never know God for God is love love responds to love the movie Avatar when they say I see you is the beginning I see who you are and I love you I invite you to simply take a breath and breathe with me with each of us <sighs> moving into a space where we are open and receptive part of being in a circle doesn't provide back rows for people to hide. We are present to each other. We come with openness. We come with vulnerability. And we come with love. We acknowledge that we have been wounded in the past when we have offered our love. We acknowledge that who we are contains all of the wounds from the past. All of the suffering, all of the pain, all of the verbal abuse, all of the ways that we may have been judged. We choose to move beyond that, to release it, to forgive, and to go forward with open arms and open heart to live in a world where love is possible. There is so much pain and suffering in our world right now. And the answer to that pain and suffering is our ability to love. We talk about love and yet moving from the concept to the action is difficult for us. And we acknowledge that difficulty. But together as a community, we can stand and support each other in being. A simple message, but a challenging one to bring into practice. So we support each other in practicing together to the very best of our ability as we become the people who can help to heal the world. We are grateful for the opportunity, so we simply say thank you. Thank you, God, for all that is and all that we can be. And so it is, and so we let it be.
Amen. This is our opportunity to share, to um, bless Unity on the Avenue with our financial gifts. I know many of you are consistent givers and we are grateful for all the ways that you give. We are also grateful for the money that you share with us as you um, are led. So I invite you to simply repeat our offertory affirmation as we know that summer is a time of travel and a time of people being away we know that um, funds get a little skinny sometimes in this in the summer here so we appreciate all that you share with us together divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all, all that, that I, I receive. receive. We've cleared off the table, leftovers saved, washed the dishes, put them away. I've told you a story tucked you in tight at the end of your knockabout day. As the moon sets its sail to carry you to sleep under the midnight sea, I will sing you a song no one sang to me. May it keep you good company You can be anybody you want to be You can love whomever you will You can travel any country where your heart leads And know that I will love you still You can gather friends around You can choose one special one And the only measure of your words and your deeds Will be the love you leave behind when you're done There are some who grow up Strong and bold, there are some quiet and kind. Some race on ahead, some follow behind, some go in their own way and time. Some love women, some love men, some raise children. Some never do You can dream all the day Never reaching the end Of everything possible for you You can be anybody you want to be You can 
love whomever you will you can travel any country where your heart leads and know that i will love you still you can live by yourself you can gather friends around you can choose one special one and the only measure of your words and your deeds will be the love you leave behind when you're gone yes the only measure of your words and your deeds will be the love you leave behind when you're done. All right, good song, Malian. Thank you. I don't see any children today. So let's bless our children who are not in the room but are doing wonderful things elsewhere and our own inner child as we generate a little energy and send it forth. Children, you are loved, loved special, and, and important. We, we see you and bless, bless the divine, divine being that, that you are. are. And our prayer for protection. The light, the light of God, of God surrounds, surrounds us. I am that light. light. The love of God enfolds us. I am that love. The power of God protects us. I am that power. The presence of God watches over us. I am that presence. Wherever we are, God is and all is well. Lunch downstairs. <laughs> <laughs>